Hi, welcome to All Nations Revival Church. Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome. Hello, welcome to all ARC members. Welcome, ARC. Yeah. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to All Nations Revival Church. Welcome to ARC and thank you for my flowers. Welcome to All Nations Revival Church. This is Sunday the 10th of May. I hope you enjoy the service. It's been great to see the nation celebrating the 75th anniversary of VE Day. I don't know about you, if you've been involved in any street social distancing parties or if you've sensed it, just watching um, and celebrating and remembering people um, who gave up their life so that we could have freedom and liberty. You might have watched some services on your TV, but um, in the next clip, we're just gonna see if you recognize who is leading the celebrations on their street and then we're going to Lenin's going to pray for the key workers and the NHS and people who are risking their lives right now to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. <laughs> For the NHS workers, key workers and those feeling lonely and isolated during this time. Dear God, we commend to you the NHS workers that serve us with such courage and dedication during this time. We pray that the Holy Spirit comes beside them and they may be feeling physical and mental exhaustion. Lord, we also pray for those who are feeling isolated and lonely. We pray that they feel your strength and love as they draw near towards you. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we're going to have a time of worship. Uh, feel free to stand, sit, or whatever makes you feel comfortable.
let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is alive and active. And we just ask that you will speak to us through your word right now as Kevin shares. Psalm 51 says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant in me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Amen. Hi everybody and welcome to church today. I thought I would do this preach in my back garden. I hope that there's not too many distractions for you, but it's a glorious day. Um, this message is coming to you on Sunday the 10th of May 2020 and it's my last part in the series of the profound ways of God. Why am I talking about that in these times? Well, the reason I'm talking about God's profound ways is, is simply this. The more we come to know the ways of God, the more we will love him, the more we will trust him, the more we will know his security and the stability of his presence in our lives. And uh, many of us know this, you see, um, at, at these times of the coronavirus, um, it's not an army that's attacking, but whatever is attacking is causing so much fear that I believe it's really important that we have our trust and our faith in the one that says, do not fear, but trust me. So knowing God's ways is to love God and to trust God, particularly in these times, but in good times as well. God is not just um, for the bad times, he's certainly for all times. In fact, he wants us to enjoy the presence of his company on the journey of our life because he's the one of course that gives us a full life a profound life let's use that word again life in all its fullness now my wife Jane has funny ways um, uh, she's indoors at the moment she's not hearing me say this but I have funny ways as well um, God doesn't have funny ways but he has ways in which are far higher and deeper and wider than we can fully understand. So when we're talking about the ways of God, we need to know that our God is a good God and that we can trust him. Let me tell you about a couple of ways of my wife. One of um, the ways of my wife is that she talks to herself. Um, I'm sometimes upstairs and I can hear her chatting away to herself downstairs she's in the kitchen doing stuff or she's you know she's in the other room and she's talking to the television uh, and I just love the way Jane talks to herself but there's another way as well and uh, I just share this um, you know Jane gets things ready for the following morning she's a early bird she likes to get up um, and go to work early she's usually the first in work in fact when I um, first started to date her, we worked for the NatWest Bank in Wimbledon and she was the key holder. She would open the bank before anybody else got there. Now, it, in our house, Jane likes to use uh, this Aussie shampoo and uh, one of Jane's ways is that she'll get stuff ready the night before in order that she can be up and out first thing in the morning. And you know what? She even takes the top off of the shampoo and conditioner the night before so that she hasn't got to do it in the morning. That's one of Jane's ways. And you know what? I love it. I love Jane's ways. And just like we discover God's ways, we will love God's ways when we discover them more. So over the last two weeks, um, we have looked at 
uh, some of God's ways. And I'm just going to remind you of what I've already said. The first one is that God tends to allow stuff to happen that we probably wouldn't. The second one is that God's timing is often not our timing. God doesn't wear a watch. The third one is that God guides us on a need to know basis. And so we have to trust him and depend on him daily. New are his mercies every day. The next one, which is the fourth one, is that God cheers us on. He actually shouts out to us, advance when we are feeling like retreating. Okay, so what I'd like to share with you now is four more ways of God. Now, there are millions of ways that God has, but I want to share with you four from my own um, discovery, really. And the next one is this. And this came to me, really, just this week. It wasn't one that I had written in my notes before, and it's this, that God just lets us get on with it. He lets us do our own thing and go our own way. He doesn't stop us, you know. Um, I'm reading through the book of Judges in the Bible at the moment, and this is where God's people, Israel, they're in the land he promised, they're being blessed in a hundred thousand different ways, and yet they turn away from him. What does God do? He says, okay, guys, if that's what you want, you go off and you do your own thing. And what happens is everything starts to go wrong. You know, okay, things may well have been good for a season, but eventually life begins to fall apart. And God puts down the road, even the wrong way, even the, the way of the wicked that the Bible speaks, even when we decide to do our own thing, God still graces us with his love. He still gives us, he still speaks to us through his beautiful creation and all of all the time down that way, God is reaching out for us in order that we might stop in our tracks. But just like the story that Jesus told of the son that went off and did his own thing, we call it, don't we, the parable of the prodigal son. God did not stop the son going. Why? Because God's not going to force you and I to love him. He wants us to do that of our own desire, our own free will. Why? Because he loves us so much. And when we come to discover that love for ourselves, then he will be the most important person in our whole life. And it wasn't until that young lad who was away from home, he was in the worst possible place, a Jewish boy in the pigsty, looking at the pods the pigs were eating and wishing that he could eat them himself. That was where he came to his senses. When he came to his senses, he decided that he was going to repent. He was going to go back to his father and he was going to say to his father, Father, I don't deserve to be your son. Please make me like one of your hired servants. And what does it say? Well, in this story, the father is a picture of God. As soon as that son starts to make his journey home, the father is watching, watching at the window all the time. And as soon as he sees the son, this old man runs. He embraces his son. He can see that the son has come home, that he's sorry, that he's repentant, that he doesn't want it to be the way it was. The son isn't expecting anything really, except perhaps to be a servant. But the father embraces him, restores to him, back into the family. In fact, kills the fatted calf. <laughs> Everyone was happy, except the fatted calf <laughs> and the older brother who started to judge his younger brother. But you see, our God is a God, a loving God. Yeah, and because he loves us so much, he will even allow us to go off and get it wrong and go our own way. Many of us have done that, haven't we? Many of us, um, you know, we've come to faith in Jesus Christ through need in our life. See, no one comes to faith unless we realise our need. God lets us do our own thing. But all along the path, he's crying out to us in a hundred different ways. Come back home. <laughs> you know, we want to choose for ourselves. But actually, when we allow God to choose for us, then life starts to take on real meaning and real purpose. So um, that is the fifth one. The sixth one is this, that God, one of God's ways is to 
forgive. To forgive. If we are honest, it's not something that naturally you and I want to do. When we are hurt, when someone uh, becomes an enemy of ours or um, hurts us or disappoints us or lets us down in some way or another, then we want nothing to do with that person. In fact, so often we hear the words, I will never forgive you for what you did to me. But you know, that's not the way God is. God will forgive us. In fact, that's why he came. Yep, God will forgive us. Um, but I hope that you will also forgive me because as you can see, I'm indoors now. Why is that? Well, because my iPad started to overheat being in the back garden in the sun. So forgiveness is, is something which doesn't come natural, does it, to us, but it does to God. One of God's ways is to forgive. Why? Because he loves us. He loves us so much. Our reading this morning, so well read by Mel, was from Psalm 51. Uh, and it was about David. David, David, the man the Bible calls after God's own heart. Well, um, you would expect someone like that not to make any mistakes, wouldn't you? You'd think that here's a guy that will keep all ten commandments without foul. And yet one day David breaks five or six of them in one go, including committing adultery, committing murder, coveting, stealing, and so on and so on. And yet in Psalm 51, we find how uh, David's relationship with God, his, his friendship with God was broken during that time of sin. Yep, he knew what he was doing. Um, he chose to do it. But it actually served as a block for God's grace to flow into his life. And uh, we see David's prayer in Psalm 51. We see him crying out to God. It is an amazing um, psalm, isn't it? Uh, and, and here, just let me mention one of two, one or two things that David says. He says, uh, cleanse me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. You see, um, when we go off and we do our own thing, uh, when, when we're not confessing to God, we're, when we're hiding stuff, pretending everything's okay, it really isn't. It causes us to feel heavy. For David, it just felt like his bones were being crushed. He cries out, create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew in me a steadfast spirit, one that is strong and not wavering. Lord, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. David had seen God do that with the former King Saul. And what was the most important thing in David's life was his relationship with God. And he understood that by the Holy Spirit that was upon him. The same is for you and I. Our relationship with God is by the Holy Spirit that God graciously pours out upon us. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. He had no joy. Have you got joy in your life at the moment? Let me tell you, God wants you to have his joy. He wants you to have his love, his peace. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And then David goes on. And you see, David received all of these things from God. And then he said this, then I will teach transgressors your ways. In other words, I'll teach those that have gone their own way, gone their own paths. I'll tell them what God has done for me and sinners will turn back to you. I, I hope that some of you that are watching this, you know, you might think, ah, you know, I say this every week, don't I? Um, God is calling us home. He's calling us back. He's a forgiving God. And the only way to come back is to acknowledge that we're sinners and that we need his forgiveness. It's really interesting. The Bible is so honest. Of course it is, but it really is honest. Some of you might be surprised to hear that it says things that we probably wouldn't expect it to say. Jonah in the Old Testament of the Bible really didn't like the fact that God was a forgiving God. He was sent with a message to the Assyrians, you know, a people that were oppressing God's people, the Israelites. Jonah knew that if they repented of their sin, God would forgive them. But he didn't want them to be forgiven because he hated them. They were uh, oppressing and Israel was paying tribute to them. When God 
did forgive them. Jonah was angry with God. In fact, if you read Jonah's uh, book of the Bible, it's really short. It's only about three pages long. You find him at the end really, really disappointed and angry. It's a sad end to his Bible book. When Jesus hung on the cross, he cried out to his father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. God's love is shown to us by Jesus dying on the cross to forgive us for our sin. He did it for you and he did it for me, he did it for the whole wide world. But the reality is that we will not receive the benefits of it unless by faith we repent of our sin. Get down on our knees, repent of our sin. Ask God to forgive us. He will forgive you. He will cleanse you. He will restore. He will heal. He will wash. And maybe for some of you listening to this, you'll begin to start a journey that God had always intended you to be on. Do you know, like I said at the end of last week's message, perhaps even for you and me, the best is yet to be. I really believe that. God shows us our sin. He's so gracious and so loving. He shows us our sin in order that we will repent of it. The second verse of that amazing hymn, Amazing Grace, says, <laughs> amazing hymn, amazing grace, says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. In other words, God showed us how bad we were in order that we would confess and then he could forgive, take our sin away and say that is the end of that. Amazing, isn't it? So this is another way of God to forgive. The next one, okay, second to last one is this, that our God gives grace to the humble. This is an unusual way of God because, you know, often we think that strength is in pride. You know, we want to be proud. We want to be independent. But actually, the Bible teaches us that we need to be dependent on God and interdependent on one another as well. And that grace and grace is another way of us, um, of the Bible telling us that everything we receive that we need from God comes by grace. It's undeserved. And it cannot be earned. God's grace flows downhill. When I was growing up, the um, the pastor in my church, his name was Skip, Skip Waters. Some of you would have known him. He lived in Westfield Road, Love Lane, Mitcham. He was such a godly, such a humble man. He used to tell us that he was when he was in the army, that he used to get down um, on his knees every night, I think in the morning as well, and he would pray to God. People would mock him for that but over the years and over the time that he was there in the army people came to respect him as a godly man, one who put his faith into practice and uh, and I want to encourage you maybe tonight get down on your knees before God. Two things, one acknowledge that he is the creator, that he is your creator and holds your your, your life in his very hands. Secondly acknowledge too that he is your heavenly father. And this is where it all be get, begins to get very personal because he wants us to enjoy him being our heavenly father and us being his children in his family. And that's a humble thing to do because we're saying that uh, I can't live my life myself. I need to depend on God. Yes, we do. Uh, God gives grace to the humble. In the Bible, Moses is called the most humble man that ever lived. And who wrote that? Moses wrote that <laughs> under the inspiration of God. What made Moses the most humble man? Well, I think it had to do with his desire to know God intimately. I think it was. It didn't happen immediately like that for Moses. I think it was a journey um, with God where he began to see what God was like and what he was like, and how he was so in need of God's grace in his own life. Moses became very humble. Towards the end of Moses' life, God said to him, Moses, uh, you're not going to go into the land that you're leading these people to, but um, Joshua is going to take over. In fact, what I want you to do is to anoint your successor, Joshua. Now, Moses had been training Joshua. He was his assistant, um, probably 40 years or so younger than Moses. I don't know about you, but if that was me, I might have said to God, you know what, God, I've had it with you. 
I've led these people for 40 years through the wilderness. I made one mistake in the desert where I didn't do what you said. And you're going to hold that against me? You're not going to let me take these people into the promised land? You're going to let someone else do it? You're going to let Joshua do it? But not Moses. Moses was humble. (laughs) He anointed his successor. He prayed over him. He blessed him with all that he had. Wow. One of the things that I find hard, I don't know whether you do, is that I I feel sometimes I'm competing with other people. I might look at them and think, "Ah, wish I could do it the way they did it. Sometimes I feel jealousy rising up within me. I don't know whether you feel that sometimes, um, but I certainly do, if I'm honest. Um, But God doesn't want us to be like that, you know. He has um, made us individually. He has made us uniquely. You and I have a race to run. And only you and I can win that race that God has mapped out for us. And if we stay close to him, we will win. In fact, God wants us all to be winners. And so competition is good, but don't let it become competitive. Don't let it. And I'm saying this to myself. Don't let it. um, Don't let that stop you from becoming the person God wants you to be. Humility. God gives grace to the humble. When we're proud, we... Um, we block God's grace flowing into our lives. And again, it's like God says, OK, you go off and do your own thing. It doesn't stop us being Christians necessarily if we have given our lives to Christ. But it does stop us enjoying the blessings of all that Jesus did for us on the cross flowing into our lives. The humble, you know, the ways of God, the, the humble ways of God are so different from our ways. He tells us to bless those that persecute. Us. That's not something that I want to do sometimes, you know. Um, he wants us to admit when we're wrong. We don't want to do that sometimes. We want to cover it up, don't we? But God's ways are just not our ways, but they are the best ways. So that's that way. Let me come now to the last way of God. Um, of course, there are many more, but um, in this little series, this is the last one. I want to share with you comes from Romans chapter eight and it is so well known to most of us as Christians. In fact, we quote it in church all the time that God makes all things work together for good to those who love God and have been called according to his purposes. You know, that can't be said for those that don't love God that are not trusting God, that are going their own way. Yeah, God is reaching out to everyone because he wants us to to, to stop going our own way and turn to his way. But the truth is, when we give our lives to him, when we acknowledge our need of him, he promises to make all things work together for good. Wow, isn't that amazing? Do you know, it certainly is. Um, Let me put it like this, that God plants seeds where you and I leak. And that sounds quite rude, doesn't it? But I don't mean it like that. Let me tell you a story. Um, uh, And um, it's a story of an old water carrier that used to carry two pots on a pole, one either side on his shoulders, as he walked down to the stream to gather water to bring back to his home. And uh, he would go to the stream, he'd fill both um, pots up with water, he'd put them onto his pole and he would walk back home. Now as he walked back home one of the pots was had a leak in it and by the time they got back home um, it was only half full of water whilst the other pot of course was full of water. Well the story goes like this that one day um, the leaking pot spoke to the water carrier and said to him you know what I'm so sorry that um, I uh, that, that I leak water and I cannot um, bring back to you a full um, pot of water like the other pot can because of my mistakes, because of my leakage, because of the flaws in my pot, then I'm not as good as the other pot. And the water carrier said to him, <laughs> said to him, it's a pot. <laughs> so the water carrier says, 
did you notice that on the way back from the stream to my house there were flowers on your side of the path but not on the other side and the reason is I knew all about your flaws I knew all about your weaknesses I knew all about your sufferings I knew uh, all about what you're like and I planted seeds your side of the path because when you leak water it watered those seeds and as a result those beautiful flowers have grown up and I pick those flowers and they adore, they adorn my table in my house. Isn't that a great story? And I think that there's a real truth in that story. Our leakage, our weaknesses, our suffering, our flaws, waters seeds in other places. In places that we have no idea. Um, a few months ago, Sid, you're listening to this in church was telling me of um, how him and Maureen were visiting I think the hospital they were having their eyes tested or they were um, they were having uh, yeah they were having their eyes tested and, and so they were at St George's and they're sitting in the waiting room and they started talking um, about church to some of the people that they got chatting to a lady and a man that was there as well um, and they were sharing their faith if you like in Christ well weeks later I went to visit somebody over in Morden, a lady I was doing some accounts for a school and um, I happened to speak about our, our bus the Hope bus that came into the school and she said oh she said that's funny she said I was talking to somebody at the hospital when I took my mum there to the eye clinic just recently and I came to realise that this was Sid and Maureen talking to these people they were they were in their weakness in their suffering in their um, well, I don't know, really. You, you understand what I'm saying, don't you? Um, that, that being in a place where perhaps they didn't necessarily want to go to the hospital to have their eyes tested, they were watering seeds, seeds of the goodness of God, seeds about the gospel of Jesus Christ in the lives of other people. Whatever you are going through, and I know some of you are going through some real tough times at the moment, you are, you are suffering. Maybe you've got a sickness, you've got an illness in, in your body and you're crying out to God and you do not understand what you're going through. This is the promise of God to you. That God promises to make all things work together for good. Why? Because you love God. And I know you do. And I'm, I'm overwhelmed by your faith through the times of suffering. I'm overwhelmed that God would use you to speak into other people's lives of how your trust and faith at this time is actually watering seeds in other people's lives. We wouldn't do it like this if we were God, would we? But then we're not God and we're not good. You know, we sometimes define God by what we believe is good. But Good does not define God. God defines good. And his goodness is way higher and way deeper than ours is. His understanding has no limit. All his ways are just. He instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. Listen, all the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. Well, Jesus, commit, Jesus um, kept the demands of the covenant for us. And so all we have to do is stay connected with Jesus. Stay in him. Trust him in him. I'm going to finish now this talk, these three talks on the profound ways of God. And I want to do it. We've just declaring to you some incredible statements from the Bible on these ways, the profound ways of God. They are a mystery. They are revealed in Jesus Christ, God's own son. Listen to this. His judgments are unsearchable. His paths are unknowable. His gift is undescribable. 
His love is unconquerable. His joy is inexpressible and unspeakable. His peace is incomprehensible. His power is unmeasurable. His riches are incomparable. He gives us a hope that is imperishable. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, would finish by saying this, that he was be prepared to lose everything to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus as Lord. I pray that you would know that love too. Know the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus as Lord and Saviour. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this series that um, I've been speaking. Thank you for what you've taught me. And I pray that everyone who is listening to this in some way or another would take something from these messages and that your Holy Spirit would bring life in all its fullness to those who are listening. In Jesus' name, Amen. As we finish, um, we've uploaded for you um, some music. It's called The Blessing. It's been put together by many churches across the UK. Enjoy it. Let God minister to you through these words as God blesses you at the end of this message. Amen. from heaven this isn't second guessing we know that we are protected may the peace that surpasses all understanding be our message 
Grace and favor's in your nature, in your essence. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations. And your family and your children and the children and the children. May his favor.